Um, I'd also like to recognize uh, my co-chair, Suzette Mayer, um, who is so happy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have I been saying it wrong all these years? It's okay with Mr. Lake. <laughs> <laughs> Admire. I'm so happy to have you as a colleague because you're hilarious. Um, <laughs> um, and she so generously, you know, come into this conversation with me um, around this set of, I think, what is a really important set of issues. Um, and it's at a time when our discussions are not, they're not always, they're not easy, right? Um, but, but, but broadly through our communities, it hasn't necessarily been easy. And so I just really appreciate um, what a wonderful friend and interlocutor you've been through the, through the course, actually, of the long duration of our, of our friendship, um, but particularly through the, the time we've um, been working on this even together. Thank you for an excellent job of hosting last night. And I'm not sure what you said about me, because I wasn't <laughs> <didn't> here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, thanks also to our wonderful readers last night, David Cheriandi, Rain Prudhomme Cranford, and Cheryl Fogo, um, for starting us off on good feet, as well as those who will speak today, um, including um, those just mentioned, as well as Nadine Chambers, Wade Compton, Christian Bowlby, Marlon um, Simmons, and I hope we'll see Joshua later today. I hope he's going to be well enough to join us. Thank you all the audience for coming um, and being here with us, <coughs> colleagues, students, members of the general public, um, who have tra um, especially those who have traveled to be here at um, uh, I'd like to encourage slash remind you to sign the um, the waiver. We've got the video camera going in, in the back, and I, I really hope that you'll be willing to be videotaped so that we may have um, our conversation for the archive, um, and hopefully put some of it up on the Tea House site as well. Um, I would like to state my intentions briefly. This is something I've learned to do um, from uh, Indigenous um, elders, friends, and colleagues. But I think it's like a really good practice, actually, um, in terms of, um, of opening our event to kind of, I guess, go set the stage, to sort of say who I am and, and what I intend. Um, so this particular event has been organized through the Insurgent Architects House of Creative Writing, which is my project here at the University of Calgary. Um, this one in collaboration, as I said, with Suzette Meyer, um, with um, much assistance from two wonderful and brilliant um, and hardworking research assistants, um, in the spirit of a full and round discussion on a complicated set of issues. Um, I think we're in a moment when the necessity of speaking as has returned to us differently from the way it presented itself to us in the 1980s and 1990s, although with some overlaps. So, speaking as a privileged, queer, Asian, cisgendered woman, my intentions in this work are, are to further the work of decolonization and relationship building, broadly understood, and including critiques, the critiques and contingencies of those terms, so recognizing that they're historical, that they're moving, and that they may shift and change, but at the same time that there's power um, in those terms now, and I want to, um, uh, have that power, I guess, for all of us, um, thinking about Foucault as, as a thing that moves through us all, and rather than something that I or you or, or Suzette might hold, um, and recognize them in their present moment. And then speaking of the present, I want to recognize that present in both a, an international indigenous, indigenous way, as well as in a sort of Chinese Taoist way, as containing both the past and the future. But I also want to recognize the linear time of progress and the crisis of progress that confronts us um, this morning, today, and you know, through my own past and present and future. Um, I assert solidarity with black indigenous and indigenous liberation movements, um, particularly now Black Lives Matter and Idle No More, with the recognition that enacting that solidarity is neither, neither easy nor linear and that I can't and don't want to occupy others' subject positions. And yet, given the privileges that I have, the power to frame moves through those access, those aspects of my being that, that, are, that are privileged. Um, what I hope to do with that power is to enact a kind of non-Christian humility and process, 
and a mode of radical but always imperfect listening, while at the same time recognizing the messy ways in which Asianness is drawn, in both abject and exalted terms, into the ongoing unfoldings of colonialism and capitalism. Um, I want to recognize in particular uh, at present the work of Lisa Lowe, who calls for a historical and genealogical analysis of what she calls the intimacies of four continents. Uh, my hopes for today are for a productive and loving, um, for productive and loving critical and creative interactions to unfold um, and to build a community of thought, feeling, and action in a good way. Um, and I'm fine, when I say love, I'm fine with that love being tough love. So I don't want it to be an easy, you know, um, surface kind of love, but a, a, a deep kind of love that involves um, having some of the hard conversations that, um, that I think we probably really need to have. I'm expecting to learn a lot about black lives, histories, literatures, um, and presences, especially um, here in these western territories of Turtle Island. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to my co-chair, Suzette Mayer, and it's been such a long and pleasure to um, So I talked a little bit last night <coughs> in my introduction, or I, I talked about this a little bit last night in, in my introduction to, to the reading, but I have to say that I'm really glad to be here um, and to have all of you here. This is for what I think is a truly historic event. Thank you to Elder Anita Eaglebear for your prayer this morning. Thank you to Larissa. Um, I can't say enough. It's too bad you're out of the room because, and I'm not going to say it again. But, <laughs> but um, Larissa has been such a gift to this institution, mm -hmm. to this department, and this institution, because she's pushy and bossy and so smart <laughs> and uh, activist, and you're just such an inspiration and so wise. And I hear you talk, and it's like I just want to sit and listen. It's just, everything you say is just. Always so valuable. Um, so thank you for coming up with the idea for the symposium in the first place, and thank you to um, Micah Jacobson and Ben Rowe and volunteers Jade Ma Vierling, Neil Serkin, Rebecca Jellin, and Joshua Whitehead. So I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to today um, as a chance for us to all, all gather and talk in celebration, but also in that fruitful, robust way that comes out of asking hard questions of other people and of ourselves, and of our scholarship, and of our craft, our writing craft, and I hope that this is a space in which that dialogue can occur in the best way. Lillian Allen was here a few years ago for another tea event, uh, organized by Larissa, and I can't help but recall a few things she said. Uh, she said that as black people, we were not brought in to help, but were brought in as part of the colonizing project. And she remarked on her unease with this settler label for herself for a number of reasons. She also said that, quote, until this country address addresses indigenous people and racism, there's no hope for us, end quote. So as the child of people who immigrated to Canada in the 60s, I will say that I am a settler. Um, but I understand Alan's ambivalence about the settler, not settler label. And I agree, I agree with her wholeheartedly that there's no hope for us until indigenous people and racism are addressed. And I fervently hope that today will be a, if hopefully, a tiny move in the direction of that hope, fulfilling that hope. So thank you all for coming, and let's make it. Christian Olby, our local. <laughs> <laughs> so Christian Olby uh, teaches at the University of Calgary. He's been a warehouse worker, mover, construction worker, grocery clerk, waiter, bartender, baseball instructor, teaching assistant, hockey coach and umpire. He has spent the 21st century so far teaching in the English department at the University of Calgary. He's published on the 19th century African-American descended Canadian abolitionist Marianne Shad, the literature of slavery and abolition, and on the works of Dion Brand. These days, his greatest pleasures beyond the humans in his life are cre critically engaging literature with large groups of people, cross-country skiing, and using a ball and stick in the never-ending search for the pure line around a golf course. <laughs> All right. Um, um, uh, Nadine, uh, let's, oh yeah, Karina. So Karina, uh, Karina Vernon is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough, specializing in Canadian literature, Black Canadian cultural studies, collective memory, archives, and Canadian urban studies. Two book-length projects underway include the Black Prairies History Subjectivity Writing, which constructs an archive of Black Prairie writing from the 19th century pioneers to contemporary writers, and the Black Atlantis, 
Black Prairie Literature and Orature, a selected anthology of Black Prairie writing. She is the co-founder and editor of Commodore Books, the first black literary press in Western Canada, and she is active with the Hogan's Alley Memorial Project, a grassroots cultural organization engaged in local archival work toward the publication of an oral history of black Vancouver. Nadine Chambers uh, is an Afro-Caribbean raised by working class grandparents and a librarian mother in Jamaica with the last 25 years in the semi-rural and urban Pacific <coughs> West Coast of Canada. Her formalized studies have been primarily hunting colonization in the areas of gender, law, resource management, literature, and indigenous studies. She left formal school in 2012 to remain ungovernable and free to travel between subjects, languages, and transatlantic thought paths. And last but not least, David Chariandi grew up in Toronto and lives and teaches in Vancouver. His debut novel, Sukuyon, received stunning reviews and nominations from 11 literary awards juries, including a Governor General's Literary Awards shortlisting, a Gold Independent Publisher Award for Best Novel, and the Scotiabank Giller Prize Longlist. His second novel, Brother, was also longlisted for the, for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, and recently won the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize in 2017. So please join me in welcoming all of our panelists. things with so I'll be very interested to see uh, you know how you feel uh, about some of these uh, observations all right uh, I've decided to start with uh, a few quotations from uh, different texts that I've taught over the last couple of years so you can get a sense of uh, the kind of things uh, the kind of works that we're dealing with in class and uh, the types of issues uh, that come up and of course are, are part of this uh, little presentation here all right uh, so the first one is from uh, Langston Hughes's poem, uh, Harlem Sweeties. All right, he goes, uh, let me repeat, caramel, brown sugar, a chocolate treat, molasses taffy, coffee and cream, licorice, clove, cinnamon to a honey brown dream, ginger, wine gold, persimmon, blackberry, all through the spectrum, Harlem girls vary. All right, and uh, the second one, we can just scroll up a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, this is from uh, Garnet Raven speaks this from Richard Wagamese's Keeper in Me. I was getting the eyeball from women, and being an Indian was the furthest thing from my mind again. I walked around with a head full of blues, Motown, and soul, and feeling like I'd come home. So this is uh, the moment when he's hanging out with the Lonnie Flowers family, a, a black family in Toronto. So Garnet is searching for his identity, and this is uh, one stage uh, on his quest. Uh, the next two uh, come from Zadie Smith's uh, White Teeth. The first is Alsana Iqbal. Pa, it just goes to show, said Alsana, revealing her English tongue. You go back and back and back, and it's still easier to find the correct Hoover bag than to find one pure <coughs> person, one pure faith on the globe. And then uh, this is Irie Jones, the mixed race character. All right, uh, Caribbean and English from Zadie Smith's White Teeth. In a vision, Irie has seen a time, a time not far from now, when roots won't matter anymore, because they can't, because they mustn't, because they're too long and they're too torturous, and they're just buried too damn deep. She looks forward to it. All right. Okay, I would like to take this opportunity to pose a, a proposition in the form of a question every once in a while. I still have to check to see. They might work. <laughs> All right, so pose a proposition in the form of a question to the panel and to the audience. Has history brought us to the point where we should let go of our love affair with the signifier black 
and the habitual framing of identity and difference in terms of color. Perhaps it's helpful to explain how this question has arisen for me. To begin, make no mistake, I've used and continue to use the term black to refer to myself, my family, and that segment of the population with which I share the privilege of powerful pigmentation. <laughs> However, a range of experiences have brought me to the point where I've come to question not only the accuracy, but also the usefulness of a discourse wound around the contradictory core of color identification. And so this will proceed in three sections here, uh, just trying to give you an idea of how I've arrived at, at these types of questions. First, family. I belong to a family with roots that stretch deep into the long history of African descended peoples in North America. Since the antebellum period, the majority of my ancestors have called the corridor in southwestern Ontario that runs from Windsor up to Chatham, Dresden, and Buxton home. For more than a century and a half, the family has identified itself as Negro, colored, and, uh, for as long as I've been around, black. This, despite the fact that subsumed within and perhaps obscured by this term, is the German ancestor, Abraham Shahat, the Irish great-grandmother, and, I am told, the genetic accents uh, you know, from uh, native peoples uh, in North America that are always the first to shine through when the summer suns uh, reminds us all of the African within. However, at this point, decades after the westward migration of a single black woman and her four sons, the future of this family is in the hands of five young women that, if we could bundle up what we might call the color content of all of them, and put it into one, she would rarely be identified by most with the descriptor black. It has become clear, and to some degree painfully so, to the older members of my family, that when the children of this latest generation arrive on the scene, history, laughing all the way, I'm sure, will relegate the black in this deeply black Canadian family to the misty realms of memory. Preserved, perhaps, for a while in the flickering faces of the old people around the Christmas table, until it disappears altogether. So, if cast in terms of color, we might say the autumn of this black family, inexorably, it seems, finds its denouement in a wintry whiteness. So the question arises, in what way, if any, can these future generations hold on to some notion of black identity, where black is fated to become a floating signifier, with no easily identifiable ground of signification? Second, teaching. Make no mistake about it. <laughs> With me, the black runs bone deep. My earliest memories run back to the smoke from the Detroit riots rising over the river only a few kilometers from my childhood home, to my aunt teaching us black power chants and making it clear why the Jackson Five was infinitely superior to the Osmond brothers. That's <laughs> 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 true. Puberty arrived uh, just in time to share in the collective cultural trauma of viewing the television miniseries of Alex Haley's Roots. Mm -hmm. And, if it had not already been clear, from that point on, black became a fact. A wicked weld of color and identity reinforced by the cuts and bruises that flowered on the body every time a kid would pull out the Kunta Kinte or Toby, right on the parking lots that doubled as the playgrounds of my youth. As an adult, I've stitched together a career from the threads of blackness, and so my love for this history, this tradition, this literature, and this people, as Langston Hughes wrote, runs deep like the rivers. And yet, as you might well imagine, blackness has never been far from my teaching. Like many who teach from the margins, I've found it a tricky business to try to teach critical engagements with texts and issues that, for many, if not all students, I embody. Guiding students in the exploration of literature that spans the centuries of colonization, slavery, decolonization, and contemporary globalization, I have fearlessly, I thought, <laughs> taken up and deployed the discourse of colonizer and colonized, black and white. However, over the last few years, I find it increasingly difficult to speak of human identity in these terms. Each time in class when I spoke of white people or black people, I became aware of a hesitation, an awkwardness, and behind these a doubt, a nagging suspicion, 
that the terms themselves obscured and perhaps reinforced the very problematic that I sought to destabilize. On the heels of this dawning light rose the thought that I was in fact doing a disservice to my students, that the attempt to revalue blackness at the expense of the devaluation of whiteness, whether you know, for the most part unintentional, right, uh, is a pedagogy perhaps doomed to failure, a deep and abiding failure even in the very moment of its success. Recently, after a class on white Sargasso Sea, a student uh, remarked, I like the story, but whenever we talk about white people and black people, I feel guilty. <laughs> and of all the things I would say that uh, I try to achieve in class, um, guilt really isn't one of them. Not that I'm above using guilt. <laughs> <laughs> The third section, color and identity in the globalized classroom. Over the last decade and a half, the complexion of classrooms at the University of Calgary has changed dramatically. And the globalization that is so much a part of contemporary discourse is embodied in a multiplicity of colors that signify a remarkable diversity. You have to remember that uh, I've taught um, mostly first year classes and non-major classes here and uh, I think the complexion of those classes might be a little different than the uh, complexion of uh, you know, senior level uh, English classes. So I've really faced this diversity uh, you know, semester in and semester out for the last uh, 18 years or so I guess. In this context, a, a discourse based around blackness and whiteness proves ill-suited to speak to different subjectivities whose positioning inside this system is tangential at best. So when I look around the room, I, I have students really from all over the globe, and so this old discourse around white and black is something that um, you know many of them have, uh, well, as I say, a very sort of tangential or peripheral relationship to. Further, limiting identity to color signifiers uh, re-entrenches the lines of difference inside a, a system that, by definition, depends on stasis. And here I'm interested in the way that, uh, you know, color uh, signifiers uh, in relation to identity really allow no movement. I am black, uh, I am white, and we seem to be stuck then uh, in this sort of binary situation. Over the last couple of years, I've begun to deploy phrases in the classroom that mark identity in terms of origin and descent rather than in terms of color. So, for example, character, characters in novels like Heart of Darkness, uh, Wide Sargasso Sea, or What We All Long For, are referred to as Euro-descended, or African-descended, or Caribbean-descended, rather than white, uh, or black, red, yellow, all right. Um, students are encouraged to see identity in these terms so that we talk of Nigerian descended, Iranian descended, Russian descended, Anglo descended, African descended, or one of my favorites, African Canadian descended. <laughs> so uh, I, I like the construction because uh, again you can certainly, it allows for the adding of, of specificity uh, for students. This discursive shift, which I initially believed was minimal, has turned out to have much more significant effects in the classroom than I had anticipated. At first, I thought at most it was a clever way to avoid the habitual use of color signifiers. So it was working for me. I didn't have to come into the class and you know constantly be talking in terms of uh, black and white. However, time has proved that it helps the entire class to get beyond thinking of identity in terms of color. Uh, the term allows for more accurate specifications of identity for students further adding uh, the term uh, descended to a geographic or national point of origin seems to better capture the reality of subjects and identities that are fundamentally dynamic. In this way, everyone in the room shares this dynamic vision of identity in terms of movement and open-endedness. Each student gets the opportunity to acknowledge roots, but also establishes a more flexible relationship to origins. Moreover, this description of identity is fundamentally inclusive since, despite origin, all students, regardless of melanin levels, share the experience of descent and seem to be welcome and much more willing to engage these types of conversations. Black has had a long history with its origins inside the ideological structures of colonialism and slavery. 
and its conclusion, we might say, in the reclamation projects of the 1960s, the, the Black Panthers and the Black Arts Movement. But we should remember to historicize the term, that it came into prominence and wide usage at a particular point in history, that it became really a, a, a sort of location and a site of political struggle. So you might say that historical struggle was really fought uh, over the term black. However, I would suggest that such a realization uh, could prompt us at this point, in light of the pressures, demands, and challenges of 21st century globalization, at the very least to a reconsideration and a reevaluation of the potentialities and problematics the benefits and the limitations attached to constructions of identity based on foundations of color. And this is really the thing, I just think it's maybe a point of discussion for us, something that we might take up at this point. So, the question remains, has history indeed brought us to the point where we should let go of our love affair with the signifier black and the habitual framing of identity and difference in terms of color? That's really the question that I'd like to put there today. Thank you. generosity to bring us here in this moment of the most difficult conversations I've ever been a part of in public and it would be easy to say I we, I just don't want to right to not engage and so I just I'm really impressed by your courage and your commitment to community and to moving this work forward so thank you thank you thank you for doing this um, I want to talk about what happened at the Trans Canada Conference, that's mostly what I want to talk about. I also want to talk about what I feel like I learned there. I'm not saying that what I think I learned is right, but I feel like I saw something there. And I, so I just want to talk about that. I, I'm not committed to thinking that it's the right thing, but it's just what I have to offer right now. Um, and I just have a lot of questions about how to talk right now. So that's what I want to do. I just want to talk more. And I'm so glad that we're here to do this talking. Um, so in this paper, I offer a provisional thinking through of some ideas rather than a neatly structured analysis. Taking such a risk in public doesn't feel especially comfortable to me, but I think that this emergent moment requires the courage to risk thoughts and language that is also emerging. I don't mind telling you that I sank into deep mourning after the recent Trans Canada 4 Miki Nakumini's conference. I'm not sure actually that I've emerged out of this mourning. I'm aware that the expression of such a non-rational process as mourning is not traditionally the work expected of a professor, and so I risk amplifying what Sarah Ahmed would call my category trouble. When you don't look or sound like what they expect a professor to be, Ahmed explains, then you are seen as a stranger, not at home in the category of professor. But as Roy Miki has argued, in the context of the neoliberal university, Liter literary scholars find themselves having to address the belief that researchers are nothing more than talking heads, constituted through rationality as the only method of determining what is valued as knowledge and what is not. Miki makes a strong case then for recovering the ever-present creativity of the living body and the unpredictable resources of the imagination, as well as the plethora of non-rational tensions and uncertainties that operate in everyday intellection. The difficulty of relation work calls on me to recruit all these extra rational resources. So mourning as knowledge production, mourning as relation work. For those of you who weren't at the TC4 conference I'm referring to here, it was an event that took place this past May at the University of Toronto, the institution where I am located. It was organized by Smaro Cambarelli and Larissa Live as well as a very large organizing committee located both at the U of T and right here at the University of Calgary. The overall goal of Miki Nakomini's Trans Canada 4 was 
And I'm going to quote, give you a little nutshell um, version um, from, from the website, the conference website. It was to advance Canadian Turtle Island cultural and intellectual discussion on the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. The goals of the conference were three, and I'm quoting here directly from the conference website, but that summarized a bit, distilled. One, expand the scope of how we understand Indigenous, non-Indigenous relations, particularly through literature, literary criticism, and cultural production. Two, develop and sustain rigorous yet genuine, genuine and generous dialogue across disciplines and communities example, Indigenous, Black, Asian, Muslim, Feminist, and LGBTQ in the service of justice and relationship building that are attentive to historical and contemporary oppressions. And three, provide opportunities for students, writers, critics, and the public to engage in depth in one of the most important questions of our historical moment. What role Canadian literature plays in the building of meaningful relations that can break the cycle of injustice? that began with the colonial <coughs> expropriation of indigenous land. <coughs> I agreed at the time of the conference, and I agree still now, that thinking relation in the ways expressed by this statement is the most important work I can do as a black scholar in this historical moment, and it, it is something to which I have been and remain deeply, deeply committed. For instance, at the conference, I <coughs> argued that the liberal democratic nation, as it is currently structured, has failed us as black people. This is what I said, this is how I ended my paper at the conference. I said the signs of that failure are everywhere, in the abominable poverty rates of our communities, in the state-sanctioned murders of black citizens, in the justice and carceral systems that ensure our continuing unfreedom. In the face of such injustices, I argued, it becomes easier to imagine a future in which we try not to further integrate ourselves into Canada's settler framework, including its cultural and literary ones, but rather to try to further unsettle ourselves and to join our struggles with Indigenous artists and activists. <coughs> Seeking to rebalance relations with Indigenous peoples is not only a matter of justice for Indigenous people, then. That's what I said at the conference. But the conference revealed, I understand better now, how unprepared I was and I don't think I'm alone here, for how deeply painful and triggering doing this work collectively would be. Ronaldo Walcott wrote in 1997 that writing blackness is difficult work, and that has never felt more true. For weeks after the Mikina Kuminis conference, I walked around in a languageless haze. I became acutely aware of not having the words or the structure of feeling or the logic to hold it all together the tensions and contradictions and ironies involved in thinking about blackness in relation to indigenous peoples and indigenous lands. My sorrow continues to feel deep and bottomless, and it goes far beyond Ronaldo's inter intervention at the conference, his vow to quit Ken Lit. And my sorrow goes far beyond Ken Lit and its multiple crises, too. It's really not any of these things that I'm mourning. In the weeks after the conference, I cried and I cursed these Americas for what it has taken from us, from so many of us. Our countries and our bodies and our labor and our children and our languages and our histories and our ancestors and our names. And now finally in this moment, this really difficult moment of Black Lives Matter too, we must also turn and see what the Americas has made of us, a double people, a turning away from part of ourselves to need to face another people. I cursed these Americas for this, and I understand in a far deeper way why Norbisi Phillips' poetry is the way it is in Zong, a wail and a lament. This is the only language I felt I had after the conference, and I cursed with it too. What will come after this morning I want to walk in a good way. I want to talk in a good way. I want to feel and think my way forward very carefully, beginning with my language. Where will the language come from for doing this mind, body, spirit, heart work of relation? At the Mikina Kuminis conference and after, 
I've noticed a marked shift in language, a return to some of our old essentialisms for thinking about race, especially black and white. For instance, Ronaldo Walcott's interventions at the conference, his construction of blackness and whiteness, depended on what Spivak called strategic essentialism, the idea that while strong differences in histories may exist between members of groups and among themselves they engage in continuous debates, its advantage is to temporarily essentialize, to bring forward a group identity, to challenge, for instance, the sedimented histories that animate the structures of literary institutions, for instance, Ken Lit. Two months after the conference, Paul Barrett, Darcy Ballantyne, Camille Isaacs, and Chris Singh published an article in the Walrus magazine titled, The Unbearable Whiteness of Ken Lit. And in this article, the authors worked with the same kind of essentialisms I heard at the conference. The authors write, so it wasn't entirely a shock when several days after the event for Walcott's book at a conference called Trans Canada, Walcott announced that he was quitting Ken Lit. He will no longer be attending conferences on Ken Lit, writing about Ken Lit, or working on trying to get Ken Lit to recognize black Canadian writing. While some of Walcott's colleagues at the conference responded to his excoriation with the promise that things will change and we need your voice, he appeared tired of attending yet another conference where he was one of the few black faces. But so many of us at the conference were not white. And so many so-called white people too have an intricate history. For me, whiteness is a term that finds its meaning in unequal social relations with people it understands as others. Whiteness is an ideology, ideology that is not identical with so-called white people. It's not surprising that this evaluation of the conference does not mention its explicit aim to do the working of thinking diasporic indigenous relations. That part of the conference seems to have disappeared in the narratives after the conference. The point of the conference was to think of relations, and all of that is starting to go missing in the narratives that are emerging now. And this return to essentialisms pulls us apart rather than bringing us into dialogue. Since 2008, in her book, Other Asias, Spivak has disavowed strategic essentialism as a tactic, dissatisfied with the problematic ways in which the term has been deployed in nationalist enterprises that promotes essentialism itself. Closer to Turtle Island, variously racialized writers territorialized in indigenous nations have done so much work to go beyond such essentialisms. And I don't want to forget or abandon this work and how far we have struggled to come. And I actually don't know what to do next in this talk. I was going to offer some brief readings of some work I've done. I was going to read from a short, a short piece from a paper in which I think about what um, um, Fred Waugh has done in, in his amazing book, Diamond Grove, which I think is still such an important book for the work he does this incredible thinking of Chinese and indigenous relations in that book. And he finds in that book a, a language for doing that. So I was going to read from that. I don't know if that would be useful. Uh, should I read from this? Yeah. OK. Um, <coughs> OK. One of the powerful lessons of Diamond Grill for me is that multiculturalism has given us no adequate language, no sign for tracing or remembering the complex and subtly hybrid cultures that, are, that have arisen from, our, from the interaction of indigenous and Chinese diasporas. We are not encouraged by its discourses, multiculturalist discourses, to think, for instance, indigenous inflected Chinese Canadian, or for instance, indigenous inflected black Canadian despite the long and intimate interactions of these peoples here. In fact, Waugh's vignette powerfully reveals multicultural discourses actively repress consciousness of such contact. So repressed are such contact zones in the multicultural imaginary that stunningly the Chinook Chinese contact zones of Waugh's own family remain invisible to him too until the moment of his writing. Waugh writes, 
Whenever I hear Grandpa talk like that, hi Makamak, Sitkamdala, I think he's sliding Chinese words into English words just to have a little fun. I don't know then that he's using Chinook jargon, the pidgin vocabulary of colonial interaction, the code switching talkie talkie of the contact zone. And I only realize right here on this page when the cooks in the kitchen swear you makahai at me, they've tranced the phrase out of their own history here. I thought they were swearing in Chinese. How does Wa manage in his writing to bring to consciousness what multicultural discourses normally repress? Wa moves away from the dominant epistemological and creative method of the book. The hyphen makes no appearance in this vignette. Instead, the footnote that he inserts into his prose and which ruptures the page like a ground shifting reads like a breakthrough in the logic of, the, of multicultural discourse. It enables Wa to shift toward a more enabling paradigm, the contact zone, borrowed from Mary Louise Pratt. Significantly, as Wa shifts from the hyphen to contact zone, rather than using the usual number of footnote, Wa inserts an icon, a three-leaf clover, tripartite sign of both the aleatory poetics of place, race, and identity that Pratt's term helps Wa bring to consciousness, as well as an apt visual image of the tripartite structure of the complex subjectivity Wa is imagining, indigenous and Chinese and Canadian. Again, I don't know, I don't know, how's my time? It's good. It's okay. good? Yeah, I think it's Should I just finish? Right, keep going? Okay. Um, so you can see that I'm just trying to put something together here. I'm really admitting that I don't know, I don't have the language, and I'm just trying to look around. I'm just searching around in what I've read and what I'm thinking about and the work that's already been done to try to find a language for moving forward. Um, another thing that I've read recently is Kai Kello's incredible book, Accordia. Mm -hmm. So good. So this book was published in 2016. Uh, it's an incredible deconstructed novel. It focuses on the Quebec student protests of 2012. So Kai mm -hmm. Kello um, was born and raised in Calgary. So he's mm -hmm. a guy from here, but he's been living in Montreal for quite a long time. And he, throughout this novel, he de develops this image of a flying canoe that appears to me as one methodological possibility for our moment. The canoe, as he imagines it, is more capacious than the hyphen, more capacious than the tripartite leaf clover. Um, as it appears throughout Kello's novel, it carries aloft an ever-changing crew. The first time it appears, it is piloted by two women wearing black niqabs, one in the bow and one in the stern. And the canoe that he imagines stretches and lengthens as more figures appear. So I just want to read a little bit from this book. The canoe seemed to glide above the water level. The paddles dipped into the air, not disturbing the ripples of the fluve. As the canoe sailed, it stretched to the size of a massive barge. Figures appeared inside it. Slowly at first, faint forms outlined against the night, gradually acquiring detail and solidity of color. The canoe filled with all of the distressed and disabled people from the East End. Children without parents, addicts, elderly people with severe diabetes, old smokers who moved around with iron oxygen tanks, failed business owners, chronic welfare recipients. The canoe was being paddled by four Mohawk warriors, and one of whom was Ronald Lasagna Cross, still wearing the camouflage bandana and hat that he wore at Oka. The warriors angled the canoe up the sky as they paddled air. The canoe climbed over the river, over the bridge, and then soared up over the moon, moonlight shining upon all of the silent, odd faces. The warriors stopped paddling. The canoe hovered. I just finished there. So I just want to say that I want a language like that. I don't know, the canoe might not be useful, ultimately, as a container thing. But I want a language like that, hopeful and revolutionary and relational and capacious and soaring. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nadine Chambers. <clears throat>
Um, I presented this piece in England, um, and uh, I'm going to start reading, and hopefully I, I catch the time. Um, part of it is anchored by poetry by other people, um, because it's a, it is, I like bringing people with me. So Junie DeSeal's work opens it, and I call this piece Dizzy Contre Menti Kaba, which in Haitian Creole, which is part of my mother line, uh, means when two eyes meet, the lie cannot continue or it ends. So Junie says, at grandma's knee, the lines etched on my face, my hands, are the history of our people, she says to me, but I can't read it. So grandma traces her story with my fingers. La oui, she says, here, dragging my index across the deepest brown line in her palm, starting farthest left, she says, before you, before your mother, before many women, before me, there was Anna Kaona. Everyone carries her name in the bone, in the blood, in the soul, in the flesh. Then, Isi Mem, here, she says, placing my finger now in the center of her timeline. Anna Kaona, she repeats again, golden flower, queen of Haiti, she sighs. In a rush of words, a staccato rhythm so fast, maybe I never heard them. Leogan, Anakaona, Kanobab, Christoph Colomb, gold, greed, conquest, treason, deaths, hung. 1503, this more slowly enunciated. She was hung. Each word stabbed into her palm, three spaced intervals to the right of that deep brown line. Haiti was born when Christopher Columbus discovered her. He traded peacefully with the accommodating town or Arawak of Haiti. Such nice, friendly people. Yo ravage, peuple. Yo ravage, la terre. They ravage the people. They ravage the earth. Tears. Loosing her grip, my fingernail has cut a crescent-shaped index on her palm, cutting vertically across her story's lines. Now her eyes are dry. My finger is near the end of her line. Ooh, -wee. you see right here, she asks. This is where Anna Kaona was born, Leogan. And here, this is where I was born, Jack Mel. And see over here, this is where your mother was born, Grand Gossier. And this is you, Seumenoui, Montréal, and the woman before us. I start with my sister in Junie de Seal's piece to honor that overlooked space where black people in the Caribbean hold more than just our black lineage in the effort to keep our stolen selves uncolonized. The Haitian Revolution is one of the greatest blows against the rack and ruin various European colonizers brought. The poem is the power of a black Haitian woman transmitting her stories out of white Western thinking, unsettling space and time to make an indigenous and black map that tells the stories we need hard ones included. These are the ones bequeathed, not via the internet, but within the web of our palms, resisting being blanked to continue the sacred work of, to, of decolonizing what we remember and the present in which we find ourselves. Thank you, Karina. I point the room to this mapping of Anakaona and indigeneity as contrast to the 111-year-old Jamaican coat of arms where Anakaona's people, the Tana, are portrayed resting comfortably with hands palm down, palms down on either side of the British shield. Here, the Tana are, are here, indigenous people are symbolically repurposed by the colonizer's drive to make flat all that is high and rolling, to make invisible and whatless plenty things as a Rasta man from K. Miller's, the cartographer, tries to map away to Zion notes. In this 500-year memory as living flesh piece, Anna Kaona is recognized as the original royalty and a living part of recognizing this island's mind. So different, the amnesia in neighboring Jamaican memory, where the British hide this inheritance in the coat that is a jacket of the Spanish who arrived as traitors to Examica and left as genocide heirs. And the term jacket actually means, um, in, in my dialect, a child who everybody knows the, their father is somebody else. Your daddy is your daddy, but your daddy don't know. That's a jacket. So there's a, like a Spanish and British relationship that we don't think through a lot. 
So all colonizers make maps, and in those maps lie all the intentions about territories and systemic, system, systematic political imperatives. Kai Miller's Rastaman protagonist would salute Judy's grandmother as a force against the imperial cartographic drive to make thin and crushable all that is big and as real as ourselves. I am the granddaughter of a campaigner for the Federation dream and a daughter raised on Mona campus at a time when all the ways the Caribbean speaks surrounded me as a fact. There is both pride in wishing Federation existed, coupled by trying to understand the shadows of things done by the British with our name on it before federated or untethered independence was even a thought. I will always seek the best examples and I include the hard ones across a vast in a historical, linguistic, and intellectual range that is known as the English-speaking Caribbean. My desire runs over more than a, 10 years of slow research about Alcan and how its corporate control granted by colonial authority mined out hopes and dreams and smashed rocks for smelters connecting Jamaica to British Columbia. And my work is about finding a way through the wide range of out of many one arrivals, one people, to shift Jamaican sense of indigeneity complicated by our histories as peoples trafficked, traveled, or having made their way in a society built on enslavement post-genocide. And the far-ranging consequences of the generally accepted reports of indigenous death may have created our inability to see indigeneity elsewhere. And what is just for twain is no joke for existing Tainos and other indigenous peoples. And South Asian um, Indo-Caribbean um, um, academic Patricia Mohammed wrote, undoubtedly the scars of enslavement of African peoples are deepest and no other group apart from indigenous Amerindian populations of the colonization in the West Indies suffered so much in terms of inhumanity, both physical as well as disruption and eradication of its cultural memory. But is that last part true in all ways and in all places? And I think not, for inspired by Black Haitian memory of Anna Kaono as proof of Desi contre Manti Kaba, when two eyes meet, the lie ends or cannot continue. And so my Jamaican self, after two fantastic years in Trinidad and seven, aw seven awful years in Ontario, <laughs> I arrived in 1991, knowing nothing of the lies riddling the start of British Columbia, Vancouver was and is unseated by Musqueam peoples. And I had to grapple with the charm settler of color there, Suzette um, brought forward. Where it is often is a, a response <coughs> from a question from Jamaicans. And often, you know, drew a response of, I couldn't live so far. However, I did live so far. And it was in BC where my sense of indigenous <coughs> Canada was clearest, unlike Brampton, Ontario. I learned to see the presence of many nations in the name places. And so the clarity was starkest where, you know, my citizenship re reveal a lie, right? Not one question asking if I'd seen Indigenous Canada. And so in 1997, I set out to remedy swearing allegiance to that discursive violence by setting off from that grateful immigrant path to seek some truths. And yet, I had not realized that some history of my own, things done by the British in Jamaica's name, had arrived ahead of me into that region directly, into a particular nation that had never signed a treaty. So, in short, in 1951, Heisa territory was violently restructured to build a diagnosis <coughs> melter in order to cross this Jamaican war. As Anglophones, world power is a desire for bauxite for the purpose of war as well as reconstruction after war required two things, or itself, as well as the power to transform the ore. And for Guyanese community members in the room, that ha relationship happened 100 years earlier in Quebec, in Saguenay. So in 1803, James Douglas, this tricky Caribbean man whose relationship with BC I have to pay attention to because it shadows my arrival, um, you know, arrives and in, by 1851 he was both chief factor of the powerful Hudson Bay Corporation. This is a snapshot, I'm not going to read it. But this is the timeline that I have put together <coughs> about Jamaica by year and what's happening in Heisla territory. And so what he meant to Songhees people in the capital of Victoria has been discussed in a conference just in February this year. And of course, tying the Brit British Thai Guyana to Saguenay, Quebec, and Inu people in an older relationship. And so it just keeps revealing how deep this thing, how vast, how complicated, and Brexit or no Brexit, this place called Britain trying to what? Decolonize itself from the EU. 
can never exit <laughs> stage left, right, nor back, nor continue to front when Caribbean people center just what English colonization is. And here is my timeline, and I leave it there. But what I didn't add is 1968 is when my parents meet in England, first in their family to get a degree, and my father's degree gets him a job in Jamaica at Alcan as an engineer. So my first home when I'm born is an Alcan company house, right? So this is very deeply intimate to me, what this is about. So British colonization links Kitamata and Kirkline. You could just switch that for me. Um, and I believe my work <coughs> is to swing it again to undo the concrete of colonial timelines. So I start by paying attention to things that don't fit the meta narratives of civilization. I've heard of a blue lake in Guyana, which is a tailings pond. Um, I've flown over it in Jamaica. This is a tailings pond. Could you flip again for me? Which gives different, come again, different significance because we don't have a word for lake in our Jamaican patois. So this is called Red Luck Mud Lake. We don't have a word for lake in our patois. We say river water or sea water or holes. So what implies a natural phenomenon of red mud lake is actually hides the violence of a tailings pond, right, which seeps into our aquifers and create and turns carcinogenic dust and the breathable air when it dries, which is what's actually happening. So a bridge, I'm trying to build a bridge from the rock, which is Jamaica, um, to where I landed. Um, well, this is, uh, Charlotte couldn't wait for you to see this part. Anyway, so anyway, I jump over, because lucky for me, how did I figure this through, right? Uh, from this colonial, post-colonial, legal colonial, what's it going on? But lucky for me, clear coincidence in broad daylight, you know, talking to an older Jamaican neighbor whose childhood friend you recall going to Kitimat, he remembered his unique name. I go to the university I worked at. I'm standing in line talking. Of course, my Jamaican accent, accent broad, broad. A blonde <laughs> young woman, this is you, Christian, comes up to me and asks if I'm Jamaican. I said yes, and she goes, well, she wasn't, but her father is an I say, which is my standard if you were raised in a Jamaican household anywhere in the world, and to me you are, because those rules are different. So I'm going to claim you up. Right? Right away. That's not even a question. And so she shares her name with me, and it's the same name my neighbor had given me. Her uncle was that neighbor. Mm. It's been wild. Mm. Just wild. I have, there's more of that. But my favorite, though, is my conversation in Vancouver with an Italian-Canadian horse trainer when I went to work at the racetrack as a hot walker. Horses saved my life. This is me and Nipkin having a good time here. Through sweat of your bra work, by which you will be known, i.e. hot walk, hot walking. And so this guy goes, are you Jamaica? And I say yes. And he proceeds to tell me that he ran a, mar a barber shop in Kitimat, where he drank good, good rum with Jamaican workers at the smelter. I'm just like, okay, once again. <laughs> so every time these coincidences happen, I'm bound in this, and this is my wrap up, to sort out how eyes could meet, make four with heights of people to then stare straight in the face of those who set the table for white supremacy's voracious capitalism in our lives. And I'm inspired by Marie Clement's burning vision, big time that structures a lot of how I'm doing this work. And uh, Chickasaw indigenous scholar Jody Bird, whose work is really essential. Teresa Tewa, who's Banaban Aikiribat, who just passed away this year. Her work around the Pacific, I'm thinking through analogies of indigenous people on Caribbean island people, which is really critical. And so could you flip again for me, please? I'm looking at, so this is how it works for me. There's Kirkvine in the corner, and then there's Kinemat. So just giving you a geography of space and time. I mean, there's Toronto, but we won't talk about it. It's not why we're here. You're from out west. So if you could flip again for me. So there are a number of books, Burning Vision. Rex Nettleford, Transit of Empire, Creole Indigeneity by Shona Jackson that are really important to me around. If we can rethink anti-colonial nationalism failures that happen there, then how can we rethink this exclusion of indigenous people in our discussions around race as Caribbean people? That's really critical and that's happening right now. If you could flip again for me, um, the indigenous um, in Trinidad, um, in honor of Berta Caceres, um, there was a, there's a whole thing that was happening funded to talk about um, indigenous people in the Caribbean speaking about this. Um, and I can only say I spoke on three occasions 
NBC mining headquarters, um, talking to black students about mining solidarity with Bauxite Levy, Jamaican you know, elders who are pushed out of communities to make way for these mining operations, and then invited to an I Don't Know More event. And the question is the same, unsettling. What could the, ce the celebration of Black History Month mean in unceded indigenous territory? That's my question. I ask it everywhere I go. So to close, if you could flip again for me, yeah. I think of a Jamaican teacher in the audience at the Slave Ownership Project organized by the History of Department back home in Mona <coughs> University of West Indies, who commented in distress saying, we got the writing of it wrong, so this is a rethinking of history. And I said, no, it was the best that we could do at the time. And perhaps it is time again as Nettlewood would sit would for Nettleford, um, our great queer, you know, intellectual ancestor would say for an inward stretch, stretch outward reach to go within the records and the archives and beyond to speak again to the Macomers, the village lawyers, the corner preachers, the reasoners to do the work. And I believe it is the work of all of us, you know, that are in the wake of these ships of history to deal with colonize this relationship. And it's an invitation to join this decolonization, decolonization quest to renavigate history and make room to explain these relationships with place names and food. Caribbean food is like, you know, pepper pot soup, you know, casserette, breadfruits. These things are not African. They're not. The bami, it's poisonous. Somebody had to teach our mothers how to make it so we could eat bami. This is, these are all relationships. So I'll end that this is not a task, so my Borican sister Liz Guerra calls it the mother's story. And she's found that in the archive record, <clears throat> translated the Spanish archives. So this is not just a task for academics, for all of us. And I close with Lorna Goodison's encouragement that we take up divination again and go in an interpretation and believe the flat truth left to dry on our hand miggle. Truth say, heart ease distance cannot hold in a measure, it said travel light. You are the treasure, even if you're born a jubilee and grow with your granny and eat crackers for your tea. It's say you can get license to navigate. Thank you for listening. Mm. as well that I was um, very lucky to be privy to uh, between Anita and Larissa about the importance of acknowledging uh, the unique wisdom and power of uh, indigenous elders who are women. Um, I want to give thanks too to the, um, the work, um, to the opening remarks by Suzette and Larissa by the work in both put into this uh, conference. Uh, both of you, uh, for me, are the, uh, the model of uh, honest, respectful scholarship. And it's a great honor. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, to say nothing of uh, the inspiring, uh, your inspiring practice as writers um, in the academy. So I'm going to uh, share a piece. I do feel a bit vulnerable um, offering this piece. It's um, um, it's what I consider a, a, a somewhat intimate uh, piece. Uh, uh, my, um, my mentor, um, Austin Clark, passed away last year. Austin Clark was a writer. And, um, and so this is a, a piece addressed to him. You know, I was kind of mindful of what uh, Karina mentioned about the ways in which you won imagines one should behave in the academy and what one should offer in the spaces of the academy at um, profoundly important conferences such as this one. Um, uh, so it feels like a, a, a bit of a risk, but I, I'm, I'm compelled to, to offer this piece because of the, 
because of the love I felt in this room, and, um, and also again out of respect to the, the, the complex work that's being done. And, and so this is um, this piece is about a relationship with an elder, and I think that's extremely important. I think uh, so often for historically disenfranchised peoples, uh, black people, indigenous peoples, um, um, capitalism and modernity invites us to break the relationship with our elders and with the wisdoms and insight that elders um, have to offer to us. And so uh, this is why I, I guess I, I'm addressing this piece to, to, to my elders. It's also um, a piece about a complex relationship with masculinity, a critical relationship with masculinity, because that's sometimes also the work of uh, having a relationship with an uh, to think it. And um, so the title is uh, As Man, which is a, 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 a you'll, you'll understand, a statement from the, or a phrase from the English speaking Caribbean, some of these. Forgive me for the preamble, I took longer than I thought it would <laughs> You tried to teach me how to drink, but I wasn't your best student. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Truth told, I often left our sessions both inspired and strung out. Your lunches would begin just before noon, but run well over 12 hours, <laughs> during which three separate meals and countless martinis would be ordered. The bistro where we sat would transform into a salon, wherein the great minds of the city would congregate to discourse grandly upon art, life, the world. I'd mostly just listen, intoxicated equally by the Bombay Sapphire, and by the sheer range of topics and references. I watch you carefully, always dignified, always styled like a counter, your linen shirts, your untamed dreads. You often said, as man, to me, a boast of strength and solidarity in the language of your birthplace. But I seldom felt I earned this address. After drinking late into the night with you, I would go home and throw up. You would go home and write. <laughs> <laughs> Through the machinations of your friend Ronaldo, we met up many times over the years, although more than once, when I emailed you proposing a meal and drinks, you feigned outrage. Who paying, you wrote back. You or this Ronaldo Walcott? What time the two are one are dragging me away from writing my frictions? One of those two of the most lawless brutes that my mother, God rest her soul, warned me not to set <laughs> These are these are his words. <laughs> Were we truly lawless brutes? Ronaldo, maybe. <laughs> But quiet Abdi too, but no, it's Me? Certainly in the opulence of your bistro, we were together a scene. Black men cocktailing shamelessly into the morning hours. Although Leslie would often join us, and sometimes Dion, whom you named out of her presence, the genius. When we were six or more, we sometimes struggled for seats, and at one time I suggested that we move to the back room of the bistro where there was a formal dining space with linen and glassware and polished silverware laid out. The table is big enough to accommodate us all very comfortably, but you insisted on remaining at the bar. And was this the first lesson in Boston that you offered me as a writer? You entered places that others never expected you to enter. You occupy space both alone and with your friends. But in this city, in this country, you never sit at the tables that, for us, have already been set. Mm -hmm. Behind all the opulence, behind your clothes and postures all suave and debonair, I knew there were hard stories. There was the Barbados of your childhood, 
a struggling single mother, but you continue to quote at me for violent threats to her children, countering the deeper violence of history. There were for you the difficult emotions and politics of what you phrased leaving that island place. And then there was your arrival in 1955 in the imagined Toronto the Good. Like Blaming or Naipaul, you were a scholarship boy sent to an elite school. And if you unapologetically displayed certain class aspirations, your truest sympathies lay elsewhere. You wrote about domestic workers and manual laborers. You spoke out against the prevailing myths of politeness and equal opportunity. When asked in a CBC interview about the parallels you drew between a seemingly placid Canada and the racial violence in Birmingham, you explained, in Birmingham, the Negro knows where he is. He has less of a psychological war within himself. In your first novel about modern black life in Canada, perhaps the first novel about modern black life in Canada, a woman once optimistic about immigration concludes, I never knew this place was so blasted and cruel. In your second novel, a man struggles painfully to put his words, put into words his everyday experiences of racism. This thing that he manages to express before his suicide to a friend. This thing does some funny things to a man's mind. I'm talking about the effects now. The effects. I understood in my own way this thing and these effects, but I was not an immigrant like you. I was of the generation after, taught my whole life the official stories of this place. Mm -hmm. But what you helped me see, Austin, was a bigger narrative, a deeper language. The domestic workers and factory laborers that you chose to write about, write about were not mere characters in the book, but my very own parents. And you helped me to see their dignity, their thoughts and dreams expressed in language of which I've been taught to feel ashamed. You helped me remember a past that wasn't mine, and also absolutely was mine. Mm -hmm. A being that stretched beyond the whitening suburbs, beyond the multicultural amnesia. With others, you encouraged me to complete my first book. And it was when it was at first widely rejected by all within the literary world, you helped me to keep faith. Eventually it found a home, and it surprised me by finding more readers than I imagined possible. And I know I made you proud. Although I remember you chiding me more than once for too often acting soft, like the young man in your book. The world of writing, you mourned, was tough. It was rife with disappointment. You could sacrifice everything for decades for your art. You could write many books, be recognized in many different parts of the world, and the next day be forgotten, lose your publisher, lose your home. Mm -hmm. We needed to be strong, you explained. As man, you always ended your ease being notes. As man. We knew, of course, that we were not only of different generations. We were of different people, with different experiences, different aesthetics, different politics. You were to me that living contradiction, a black red Tory. Yet you scorned what you had once in the 60s called conditioned Negroes, those who seemed content with second-class citizenship. In you, I heard both earnestly and ironically the heady languages of independence movements, of civil rights, of black power, I always watched you carefully, and eventually I realized that you had been watching me too. Soon after my first book was published, you released your own novel about the generation after, about the yearnings of mothers for the futures of their children, and of the cities of today that still permit the destruction of black youth. Your novel was entitled So Perfectly, More, and I knew you hoped it would earn you once again the success you would finally, after decades of insecurity and unrewarded labor, enjoy with the Polish show. But more didn't achieve this success, at least not the sort measured, measurable by sales and awards. And afterwards, what you wished for me took on an almost discomforting intensity. My next novel, you suggested, couldn't simply be one that was perfect personally satisfying. It would have to prove and conquer in some way. 
You got to lick all them pretenders and play-play novelists you wrote to me. Although you knew all too well that I always felt like a play-play novelist. You wouldn't hear such things from me, though. You imagine the future in the hands of people like you. So don't let me down now. Share some mix. Plax, 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 plax. I understood, of course, that your express hopes were not solely for me. By then you had been working diligently upon your own next book. Your emails would be sent to me at all hours with little discernible pattern of sleep. Once at four in the morning, you casually explained to me your dislike for computers, <laughs> your longing to work once more on my IBM Selectric template. <laughs> you explained that at this graveyard hour, I hear breaking my ass, writing non-friction, as my mother used to call it, but I go into make a martini, a dry one, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. It was in this email that you revealed to me your new project, a memoir. On the pages you wrote, I don't call them a memoir. To me it is membrane. Membrane sound more sweeter than a memoir. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Weeks later, you wrote to me very early in the morning. And when I surprised you with an immediate reply from my home in Vancouver, you seemed to forget all about the time difference. Horses or duppies riding you that you can't sleep, you ask? <laughs> you went on to explain that you would be walking more longer on membering the name of the memoirs. But then you added wryly, but I ain't known too much, not one shite about memoirs, yeah? I write in what I remember. And sometimes, I don't remember one shite. This wasn't just a joke. Your memory was indeed failing. When we got together at restaurants, I began to notice you hesitating with the menu you had perused many times, squinting at the descriptions of the dishes, maybe at the printed words themselves. I began counting the drinks you ordered, hoping the explanation right there, but I also began the habit of secretly meeting Ronaldo's eyes. Later, when we were alone, Ronaldo would tell me of the health scares you had experienced, perhaps even a stroke although none of this you ever admitted to me. Only in your emails could you concede to experiencing mild, gentlemanly maladies. You wrote offhand of an appointment to help curb my gout, but only because you had better news with which to conclude. I just drive the last spike in the revisions to the memoirs, as man, Austin. Yet, weeks later, when I wrote to ask if we could meet up, you informed me that your manuscript had been rejected. I wrote back with condolences, but I didn't hear from, back from you for a very long time. And the next time I wrote you to tell you I was coming to town, you wrote back with an appointment regarding this matter of my will. It is overdue, you explained, and being men, we are shy of making wills and last testaments. You promised that you would contact me later in the day after the appointment. But for the first time in our relationship, you didn't. What were we to each other? I wasn't as close to you as Ronaldo, or maybe even Abdi. I didn't know you for as long as Dion or Leslie. I've heard you called by some the father of black Canadian literature, but we both knew your reluctance to put it kindly about most things concerning fatherhood. We were different writers, different minds, different bodies moving through the world. You would always sign your emails to me as man, but in all honesty, I rarely saw myself in the man you invoked. I did recognize in your writings those characters who understood themselves to be fugitives from conventional masculinity, unwilling or else unable to give up, live up to prescribed ideals and roles. The title of one of your collections of stories was borrowed from those devastating, uh, devastatingly ironic lines by Derek Walcott. There are no more elders. There's only old people. But there are always elders. And you also do one of them. And in the moments I now best remember, it wasn't just strength you affirmed between us, but also vulnerability. In your very last email to me, you acknowledged that we both too often could feel very frightened and down and alone. 
depressions are a serious part of being a writer. And I remembered that in your second last email to me, your prescribed solution came from a woman. As my mother would have said to me if she was still living, take my foolish advice and follow what I say. Drink a rum one straight and say your prayers. This message ended with your predictable as man, but then you added three more words. Love, you wrote, your brother. On my last walk to your home, my last time visiting you alive, Ronaldo tried to warn me. He explained that you had changed. He said that I needed to come prepare for what I would see now. But for the rest of the walk, I could only think of times past. I remembered, I remembered a night years before when I had been hanging out with a mongrel bunch of young writers at the Grand and called you up and you appeared like a living legend of us. You were in yet another moment of poor financial shape, but you splurged insanely upon food and drink for all of us. Afterwards, you invited us all back to your place for more drinks, and I remember the looks on people's faces when you entered. Your home was amazing, walled completely with books. There was your lifetime of collected art, a photo of Malcolm X, and also that photo of you meeting Queen Elizabeth, King Coltrane ruled the air. I remember it another bright time of music and language when Dion pulled from one of your shelves a book by Derek Walcott and read for us in that voice of hers, arriving eventually at those lines, I had no nation now but the imagination. Your home as I had known it was the living and sublimely complex archive of black genius in the Americas. It was a home that you kept neat and open generously to others. But now, Arriving finally at your doorstep for this last visit, I suddenly felt afraid of entering. There was the digital lockbox outside, and Ronaldo punched in the code of 1934, the year of your birth, and then he held the door for me to step in. The place was much the same, still me, your many books still shelved high up and all around us, but you had changed. You were thin and couldn't stand. You could not do many of the things that a man takes pride in doing for himself. You were not always lucid. For some reason, you held on your lap member, which had happily been published, but you didn't seem to know what to do with it. At times, you opened it to the first pages, as if attempting to read. You fumbled with a pen, gesturing towards a page as if contemplating edits. You tried to autograph it, but failed. After long minutes of silence sitting there beside you, I excused myself and walked away to the kitchen. I stood alone and told Ronaldo hugged me and very gently urged me to try once more. And then you saw me again. You asked about my writing, about the novel that months after your death I would dedicate to you. I said that it was going all right. I was, you know, still working on it. And then, very reluctantly, Fearing the answer, I asked about you, about your own writing. You sharpened. You recovered every atom of your old dignity. Mm. You lifted member and saying, I suspect this shall be my last. Sometimes, in sometime, in those last moments together, I asked you one more time if you ever found it difficult to complete the book, if you ever doubted. You said that, yes, you had doubted, every writer doubted, but that you had always pushed yourself to finish, because I felt it was important. Shortly afterwards, the caregivers arrived, immigrants of color, both like and unlike the ones you had represented so many years past. We were helped to bed. It was time to go. But before leaving, I looked once more up at your shelves, books by Baldwin and Wright, by Morrison and Walcott, books by Giovanni and Brand and Brathwaite, all of the luminaries, all of that desperate brilliance. I saw upon, I saw among the spines your own books, Austin. For when you had the strength, you placed them up where they belonged. Mm -hmm.